good afternoon and welcome to Cody International Institute and my name is Eileen Alma. I head up the Women's Leadership and Indigenous Programming here at Cody and we're very pleased to be broadcasting from the 2018 Global Change Leaders Program, Global Women Leaders from 22 different countries, 25 in total and I can't tell you just how exceptional they are. And so today, not only do we have them, but we're also delighted to have with us the amazing champion of Cody Institute, a, a personal mentor and champion also of the work that we're doing uh, for women leaders, Dr. Susan Crocker, who is our chancellor at St. Francis Xavier University. Dr. Crocker began her professional career in the banking industry, and she moved on to become a partner of Ernst & Young. She worked as a senior vice president of equity and derivative markets with the Toronto Stock Exchange before being named president and CEO of the Hospitals of Ontario Pension Plan. And then she left the financial services industry in 2001 and she assumed a number of corporate board positions and engaged in board leadership as well as strategy consulting and fund development for nonprofit organizations. And today she focuses exclusively on the nonprofit sector and she's the chair of the Toronto Arts Foundation and a board, board member of the Gardner Museum and a supporter of many cultural organizations. And we've also had the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Crocker as um, a, a member of the advisory committee for many years, a chair of the advisory committee for the Cody International Institute. And in 2015, she was officially installed in a ceremony as the first woman lay chancellor of St. Francis Xavier University, which was no small thing. And we were really, really delighted to have her in that post. So we're going to have a chance to chat today with, uh, with Dr. Crocker, with Susan, on her own leadership journey and moving from the private sector into the board governance, into philanthropy, and finally into this educational role, this chancellor role that she's currently been <coughs> occupying. So again, welcome Susan. And let me start off by asking you to share how you became motivated, first of all, to work in the banking center sector. That's such a male dominated industry sector, like so many others are. So what is it that you saw as being critical also in that space? How did you start off? Well, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, Cody is a place where my, my uh, you know, heart awakens every time I come here. When I think about coming to St. Evex and spending time at Cody, um, I'm a graduate of Cody as well. I did the ABCD program a number of years ago, and uh, it, that itself was just a remarkable journey with other participants. So now turning to, to a bit about my career, so I didn't set out to go into banking per se. My educational background is in economics and global development. And, but I became particularly fascinated with markets. And to me, markets, uh, you know, if you think about a market as a graph on a piece of paper, like how a commodity or something is moving in price day to day, that's really a picture of human behavior. You know, what the different points of view are and how they come together in, in a transaction over an object. So I became very, very interested in you know, human behavior, um, markets. So that's how I ended up moving rather, fr rather fr from uh, a path of uh, international development per se into thinking about global markets and found my way into a role where I could um, you know, enjoy experiences in the field of foreign exchange, uh, global money movement, um, and really in banking, my responsibility was about risk. It was about that sort of big global market risk situation, which is all about human behavior. Did you find that the markets were very responsive to women? Like, and how have that, how's that maybe changed? Mm -hmm. No, I'd say no, not at all. Um, you know, it was really about uh, you know, you had to you had to yourself believe that uh, there was a meritocracy and that what you did and your achievements would carry you along. And I would say that um, I, you know I I worked hard and I tried to make a difference and tried to bring a lot of innovation to the roles that I had. But all along there was that constant uh, challenge of being typically the only wom woman. Mm -hmm. So the only woman in the room, the only woman at the conference, the 
only woman in a division of the organization, um, being moved into leadership roles where everyone reporting to me was male and was typically older than me. So, so there was a lot to overcome and I think I just uh, assumed that it didn't matter. My way of dealing with it was to go, it can't possibly be a problem. Um, I'll, I'll ignore that. When behavior is bad, I'll call it out. Uh, I'll go home and beat my head against the wall <laughs> every so often mm -hmm. and go, oh, is there a better world somewhere? Mm -hmm. And then hope to change that culture and, and start bringing other women along. Okay, so you had a strategy of really just sort of plowing through, moving through, and trying to not let anything hold you back yes. in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you, you then moved into a different space as a CEO of, uh, of a, you know, the Toronto, uh, sorry, the Hospitals of Ontario Pension, what were some of the ways that you were able to take that leadership capacity that you built during your time in the banking sector into that new role? And did you see some big challenges also with that, with a change in that new environment for you in terms of your own leadership? Mm -hmm. That was interesting because I was used to really wholly private sector. So moving into an organization like a public sector pen pension fund, it served um, the, in the constituents of that organization, you know, the beneficiaries of that pension plan are those individuals who work in hospitals across the largest province in Canada, that's Ontario. And so that, that would be everyone from nurses to orderlies who, who cleaned the floor to the line cooks to the doctors to, to the CEOs of the hospitals. And so the board structure involved uh, what's called a representative governance model. So all of the unions in the healthcare system had different rights to bring or present or nominate individuals to the board. And as well, the hospitals themselves, uh, the, the Ontario Hospital Association also controlled a number of board positions. So that meant that you had people coming to the board through, with all sorts of different background because each union had its own, um, had its own standards of what mattered. You know, in some cases, they'd be electing someone who was just a champion for workers', workers rights mm -hmm. and benefits. In other cases, they would be identifying someone with specific skill sets that would probably benefit the governance of the organization. So that meant that on average, it was probably mediocre mm. governance, some great people, some in, a, in a ver an area that they didn't necessarily have specific skills. And my role became to try to elevate the performance of this, this aggregate group of, gov of, of you know, board members and get them to serve the organization well. Mm -hmm. so, it was a terrific challenge. So running the organization itself, which involved uh, employees doing everything from managing one of the largest pools of money in Canada, you know, investing and managing the risk, to those servicing the needs of pensioners, like administering benefits, and then this board, some of whom were interested in the details and some of whom were interested in lobbying for benefits. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it challenged me in a lot of ways. I had mm -hmm. to become more diplomatic than I ever, ever thought I could mm -hmm. and, and tr try to find ways to work with all these complex cultures and histories that brought people into this organization. Right, and there's a lot of competitive interests, right, there that, mm -hmm. you know, where you might have one, you know, one with the one interest coming, as you said, and others with a completely different agenda. So you had to manage all of that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the skills I think that it takes to be a pretty good leader is mm -hmm. you know that, that managing of complex relationships, mm -hmm. complex systems, and also conflict management within that. That's right, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and styles. The fact that, you know, and you probably talk a lot about this in your programs, how you have to be prepared to adapt mm -hmm. uh, your style in order to get along and bring others along who may come from a different place or a different culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's also the organizational culture that you're stepping into and trying to also shift with that and also bring it along with you. Is, did you find that as well, moving into that CEO role? Ab absolutely. It was an organization that um, <clears throat> rewarded based on tenure. 
it did not reward based on performance, and yet it was trying to hire and attract individuals to work in roles where the, the jobs were all about performance and, uh, and people expected to be paid for that. So there was a need to update and modernize the organization and move to performance-based measurement systems right. and compensation systems. Right. So th that was a challenge. It, mm -hmm. it was something that had to happen, uh, but it, it was a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Women often question whether they're the right person for the job, and we, we call that imposter syndrome. And we, we certainly have seen a lot of reading or writing and on that topic, and a lot of conversations have happened about it. So despite even, you know, despite them having qualification, they still don't feel like they belong in the space of leader, particularly if it's that kind of elevated leadership role or it's such a male-dominated space. Have you ever felt that? And if you did, what would you advise women in terms of pushing back that feeling? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, th that feeling comes up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Does that sound familiar? Yes. It would be when you unfortunately wake up in the middle of the night and start overthinking in the dark, not a good thing. And, uh, and those, those moments, moments come up. And then I, then I find even now that there will be situations uh, that come up sort of in, in the industry that I was involved in, I think, Gosh, what was I even doing there? Was I like even qualified to be here and there? And and I think you know, uh, when you assume leadership roles, the key is you're there in a leadership role, and that doesn't mean you are the scientist who could write the formula or or mix the concoction that someone's having to deal with d down at a you know at a different level in the organization. Um, it, it doesn't mean you, you aren't in that leadership role uh, to, as the expert, as the subject matter expert. You're there because you've got the ability to um, rise above all the minutia. Um, you always uh, stand in the shoes of sort of the broader group of constituents. I always say, you know, a great sign to me if I'm interviewing or talking to someone uh, about their aspirations or what they want to do and if, if they're, they've got their sights set on leadership roles, but all I keep hearing is the me word, I think never going to happen. And, and I think that um, there are many, you know, I worked in organizations where um, there would be team leaders and, and different types of roles where you really were a, the senior expert on a team. You may lead a team, and you did it from a place of being highly expert in the role that others on the team were performing. And those roles are vital, and they're, they're necessary, and they happen in all organizations. But if you're going to have responsibility for the whole, uh, even if you did come from a place of deep expertise, You've actually got to let that go because you're going to be trusting other people, you know, to do their jobs. You're going to be not be effective at all if you're trying to do deep dives on what others have the competency to do, and you have to go work on behalf of, right? All those people who are relying on leadership to be sound, bring good judgment, help guide the organization forward. So. Um, so, you know, back to imposter syndrome, I think if I ever had doubts, it was, it was about do I know enough? I've, I've risen to this level or I've, I've gotten here for some reason and people might be questioning why I'm in that role because I didn't grow up in the organization or I didn't, um, you know, study this or study that. But I have to remind myself why I am there or why, why I was there and it was because uh, you know, maybe because I'm good at, at listening and learning and I know the agenda is to work on behalf of the collective and keep moving it forward, bringing people back to goal. So it's a different, the, the, the leader's role is a different role. That's very true and I think it's good advice for all of us. 
in terms of, uh, of, of assuming that role, but, mm -hmm. but also being careful not to take everything with you. Mm -hmm. you know, as you're moving up the ranks, and I see that in myself, and I think many women do, where mm -hmm. they're not only taking on the leadership role, but they're also taking on all the, all the other things they used to do as well, mm -hmm. um, and, and not letting go necessarily, so to the point where they're ineffective, because they're bogged down by the detail of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's something I see for women as well, sort of moving forward. So good advice, I think, from you about, you know, assuming that and letting others also mm -hmm. claim their space as experts. You've made the move entirely to philanthropic roles and to supporting and working exclusively with nonprofits. And what was your, moments, your moment of awareness of the importance of that space for you? Sounds like it started way back with your undergraduate work or your, your schooling, but what was something that sort of triggered that for you that you said, this is time for me to move into that space? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I had gone on the board of a, a large uh, public th theater organization, and, and it was so interesting because the, the people, the artistic director, the um, executive director, all of the people I was meeting working in the organization, in, regardless of their roles, were amazing. I just thought, these people are amazing. So here I've spent my whole career in global markets and doing things where everyone thinks they're the smartest person on the planet. Everyone's, you know, been to Harvard or, you know, to, to wherever, and they're, they're amazing and brilliant and highly compensated. And now here I am in this organization uh, supporting this organization as a board member where um, none of the same, you know, b benefits, um, monetary or, or fringe or anything, are coming to these individuals and they are as smart and as talented and as creative as anyone I've worked with anywhere. And I thought, you know, the not-for-profit sector um, needs supports. For sure, it always needs money, but there's more that you can do than just help provide those resources. It's really help mentor, help ensure that the doors are open for development opportunities. One of the great crises I think we have in a lot of our not-for-profit um, organizations is the budgets are often so constrained that there's no money left over for uh, for time for reflection, for uh, skill development, for management development, management training. Those are the things that are just never in the budget or they're the first to get cut. And, and that failure to invest in people, um, you know, keeps the not-for-profit sector behind in terms of evolution, use of technology, you know, and so on. So, um, Anyway, so that, that, that was my moment of reflection, just realizing I would, I would come home from a meeting about, you know, the whatever crises was happening in the art sector and, and uh, be talking to my husband who had come home from whatever crisis he was dealing with in, in, uh, in his, his world and would be having the same conversation because it would be about, you know, the challenges that talented people were navigating and I'd say, you know, um, I, can, I can be as effective working in this space as, as I could be working in this space. So it just mm -hmm. seemed like a good thing to do. Maybe I'll ask you, since many of the women in the room are really focusing on you know, how they can strengthen their organizations and look at new kinds of partnerships. And you, you've spent some time just mentioning you know, the lack of resources, which by the way is why we end up doing so many roles, right. including leader. So, you know, I think there's some unprecedented um, momentum around women's rights work, gender equality work, but it's also going to require different kinds of partnerships. So do you have any advice on what, what we could be looking at in terms of creating those new, align, uh, new uh, alliances, if you will, with, with other philanthropists or, or funders um, beyond the usual traditional? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would suggest? Yeah, it's a you know, it's interesting. I think that uh, I think that somehow we've got to get the message out to the world of funders, donors, and supporters that um, when they 
if they believe in the mission of an organization and are supportive of its work, they also really need to become supportive of the organization. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a really difficult thing. The way it's referred to in the fundraising world is um, it's very hard to generate funds that are, what's the word, un, unspecified? Oh, like yeah. A, yeah. Unrestri 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 unrestricted. unrestricted, right? So every organization is always looking for that, that donation that is unrestricted, that isn't targeted to something specific, that gives you the flexibility to invest in the capacity of the organization or help pay the overhead. And this is a, this is a big, big issue, and it applies across the sector, I'm sure globally, uh, the most sophisticated academic organization down to the uh, smaller, you know, startup, uh, creative, uh, not-for-profit. And this is a conversation, you know, we have to have. And it's hard for each organization to do it themselves. So I think where there are industry associations or mm -hmm. sectoral organizations, that has got to remain an agenda item. How do we collectively educate philanthropists, donors, right. public funders? I think also working together, coming together and saying, um, do we have a common interest, for example, in building leadership capacity and can we do something with that? So let me, let me can we do something co collectively? So here's just an example. The Toronto Art Council, which I chair, this is the funding agency for the arts in the city of Toronto. So the city of Toronto hands over $20 million a year and the Toronto Arts Council, through a system of, of peer juries, um, you know, committees and so forth, uh, allocates those funds across all artistic disciplines and so on. So anytime we've received additional funding in the last few years, we've thought to be very, very strategic. Rather than just uh, spread it out across everything, we've got, no, you know what? We need to do some targeted strategic things, and one of them was about this whole issue of leadership capacity. So we initiated something called the uh, Cultural Leaders Lab, which invited applications from, you know, ascendant leaders in arts organizations to become fellows or to become uh, m members of, of a cohort. We've now had four partnered with an organization, in that case it was the BAMP, the BAMP Center, to help develop curriculum. And the applicants come from across the whole sector. We funded this, it didn't cost a huge amount of money. We're funding this. And now already, individuals who typically competed, you know, their organizations view, viewed themselves as being in competition for everything, in competition for board members, in competition for funds, in competition for ideas, they are now solving sectoral problems. They're now working collaboratively. They are now uh, gaining momentum and strength, like just that boost of confidence from having that focus on their leadership skills and giving them the opportunity to reflect and to build their network. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's like, this is what you're doing here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, you, you are, you're part of a, you're here collaborating, you are sharing your knowledge, you're taking all that's being sort of infused from Cody, but you're bringing all of you to this, and then you're working collectively on issues, on the conversation, on the dialogue, and when you leave here, you will all be elevated, you'll also be connected, and you'll figure out some of those great intersections and collaborations that may happen across your organizations, you know, within other associations that you're engaged in. Mm -hmm. But I think that, so I think, how do we find ways, create those ideas, and then take them to people? Because there is real, a real attraction, I think, to funders, donors, philanthropists, if they hear a great idea that involves leverage. They all love leverage. Right. So they all love to hear that um, they love the, the matching, anything about matching funds. But the idea that we're coming together and we've got this great idea and it will elevate all these organizations and you, you could help us make this happen. Right. 
That's mm. right. And it's something that we've been talking a little bit about in class, which has been about moving from focusing on competition mm -hmm. for resources to, you know, uh, to working towards collaboration mm -hmm. and all the steps that need to happen. I and mean, it all comes down to building good relationships, mm -hmm. but also trusting in the process a little bit as well. Trust is so, trust and confidence, right? Right. Right. Yeah. So you, you've talked about Cody, you brought it back to us. So I'm just going to ask you a little bit about your experiences with Cody, um, which is, as we've talked about already, you've been a participant, you've been a member of advisory, you've, you've been a champion, you've been a supporter funder as well um, of, you know, of Cody programs, including this program. Why is Cody so important to you? Well, do you know, this, I think everything I've been talking about, things that I've learned and have mattered to me, somehow all uh, come to roost, mm. you know, at Cody. And, and this is a place, when I first became introduced to the work of Cody, I, it just resonated with me because it, it, it really, it came about through a presentation that a previous executive director of Cody, Mary Coyle, was doing in Toronto. She was talking about uh, Sewa Bank, are any familiar with mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Say what bank? And she showed a film. And I had just made a decision about that point to step away from my professional career and sort of shift my focus. But I hadn't been thinking. I had been thinking about what could I do, because I, I, my career had all been about sort of global risk issues and everything. I thought, but what could I be doing in my philanthropic or, or not-for-profit work that was really about global development. And then I heard Mary talk about Sewa Bank, and I saw this film, and I thought, okay, I know something about finance, and I, but I've never thought about microfinance. Um, I've never thought, I just hadn't thought about, about a lot of these things, and, and I hunted her down, and here we are today. So it, it, it just, this is where my interest and passion in global development Finally, finally, a door opened. You know, a mm -hmm. door opened. I, I started through that door. Uh, I wanted to go help Brazil. I happened to have been born in Brazil. It was just circumstantial. And uh, I, I just always sort of followed the story of Brazil and thought maybe I can be involved doing something there in development. But I fell in love with global markets and, and mm -hmm. sort of that, that dimension. So this was sort of my full circle. Mm -hmm. I went, Okay, this is where leadership, which I so believe in, uh, you know, good, effective leadership. This is where, you know, global thinking, the interconnect interconnectedness. You know, I think when you've been outside, you need to leave your country to understand your country, right? You need to uh, leave your country to um, think about its place in the world. And I heard something really frightening the other day. This is, now I'm getting political. Some ridiculous percentage, I'll say 30% and I'll be wrong, of, of um, uh, US senators hold passports. That's it? Yeah, I'll be wrong, but we can research. We could probably find, you could, could ask Siri how many US senators hold passports. But that says that in the most powerful country in the world, individuals have decided that only their point of view matters. And, and uh, in fact, years and years ago, I had an opportunity to go to Washington to testify before uh, the House Finance Committee on, on something to, to do with markets. And I remember the um, senator, senior senator from a, a state that bordered Canada said, oh, I've never been to your country. And, and I almost stopped listening through the whole rest of the thing because I thought, <laughs> how could that be? How could anyone not want to go there? So but anyway, my, po my, my, so. But my, yeah. my point to that was, um, you know, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to travel um, and, and or just the demands on their life and everything else. But when you do, it's that fascinating moment of, you know, what matters and how we are interconnected and how to understand the issues, we sometimes have to look from the outside in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to draw strength in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Chancellor. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. How has that experience for you? What have you What have you taken away from that? And how has your leadership changed with that with that role? 
Well, it's interesting because it is a, it's a ceremonial role. It's about, um, it was the first time, the university's always had a chancellor, but the chancellor was the Bishop of Antigonish. So if you were the Bishop of Antigonish, it came with your job. Mm -hmm. And so it was assumed and, and comfortably worn. The, then the decision was made to move to a lay chancellor because what the university needs from the role is broader than simply uh, part a participation in ceremonial events. The desire for it to be a voice in some arenas, for uh, the role to be a contributor to promoting the university, to fundraising, to doing other things, which requires being informed on a different level, and then also participating um, ex officio in the governance of the university. So we had to create the role. So I've really been a bit of the journeyman helping define and create the role and navigate it um, uh, and steward the role and get the university to come on side with, well, this is what it means to actually have, an, have a lay chancellor. Yeah. And so I'd say now, three years in, and my term has come to an end, sort of this month, we, we've, we've sorted out the role. And it's no small feat to do that in an organization that's pretty, um, pretty set in its ways, pretty bound in tradition. Uh, as I say, and I, really I say this um, generously and, and in fun, um, my first convocation, really all that happened was people moved seats but no one had really thought about what is she doing here. <laughs> so I went, oh my gosh, I better get to work. And uh, I, I've got a massive file on my computer which starts with, here are some thoughts on how we can make this role real. <laughs> so it's worked out. And I, and I think now the next person who comes into the role, and that's our jobs, right? To, um, take those opportunities and move them along and uh, leave them in as good a shape as we possibly can so that the next person isn't starting from where we, we were so that they can pick it up and move the organization, move that role and with it the organization further along. So I feel very good about that. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that Chancellor 2.0, lay Chancellor 2.0, um, will have a lot of fun and a great opportunity to to um, be responsive to the needs of the organization during their term, because it's about that. You're responding to mm -hmm. what St. of X needs at any point in time. Thank you, yes. And you know, you've touched on that, that final topic of succession planning, which could take us into a whole other session for today, but I thought maybe we'd just conclude, if you could give, a, give all these women one piece of advice as they move forward on their leadership journey, what would it be? That's the world's best question. <laughs> one, you know, we all speak in lists. Well, <laughs> one. We'd take a list too, but no, no. <laughs> but one is good. I think, no, I think it's it's one. You know, I think I think you have to lead from a place of real generosity. And, and I think what I mean by that, I'm getting a bit emotional because it, it's interesting. I, I'm involved with a number of organizations right now, some that are going through real challenges. And, and a lot of it's because people, people don't seem to understand that. And they're making it about them. Mm -hmm. And it can't be, you know, if you're committed to, to leadership, and to affecting transformational change in organizations that you're involved in. If you have big ideas that you want to further and move along, then I think um, you've got to approach the leadership opportunities that become available to you from a place of generosity. So, th so that means you are going to be caring you're going to be patient, you're going to listen, but you're also going to be strong, right? And, and because you, you must, 
You must. People so look to you for strength. They so look to you for strength. But strength doesn't mean a club, right? You know, strength doesn't mean, um, a, you know, yelling or raising your voice. You know, s strength is about pulling all that together, starting from a place of generosity and just being clear, being transparent, you know, being, your people need to be able to rely on you. You know, you may not do, you may not make decisions that make any, everyone happy and you won't. You know, there will always be unhappy people, but uh, they'll respect you and they'll respect the decision and they'll go along if you, you have started from that good place, you've been consistent, you've been transparent, you have shown that you've cared. Yeah. Be, be the good people that you are. That's great. Go strongly. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan Crocker. Mm, thanks. Thank you.